Hello guys, welcome to March's, March 2012's episode of My Life on the Hill. Unfortunately it's a slightly sombre episode because last week our little dog, my little mate George, shuffled off his mortal coil. And part of this month's episode will be about the creation of the burial mounds, in fact, uh, of the two dogs that are quite close together. We're also going to finish off weaving the, uh, the willow baskets that you'll have seen me start last month. And also, I'm going to get the broad beans into the ground. So, a few interesting little tidbits. So without further ado, let's get started. Well, in the last episode, we looked at our willow. And, uh, and you can see I've been a little bit busy since then. Very Blue Peter-esque. Uh, and, uh, and I'm particularly pleased the way they've turned out. I, I've done a little bit of research. Apparently, what I've done is called rough willow basketry which is quite appropriate because it's, it's slightly rough but I'll show you the finished article which is uh, this little number here you know last time we did a, a finished the base I did the base I've made a few amendments to the way in which I made the base because I kind of made myself a little bit more work so whilst this is green it's still quite weighty but of course as the willow dries out it'll be a lot lighter but the reality with these baskets anyway, it doesn't really matter about how heavy they are because they're not going to be carried from place to place. They'll just be ensconced underneath a cabinet and left there and filled with children's toys, I think. That's what they're destined for. So, uh, yeah, I'm quite I'm pleased with that. So the last time we made the base, and uh, I was coming back to it. And what I did this time, third time along, is I made the base, but instead of cutting... Uh, the long pieces that I've weaved the bottom through short I left them long and I've kind of brought up the one side and I've carried on going right the way around and, and I'll show you how I've done that these, uh, these little willow bits now and really we're kind of we're in the end of March we're sort of uh, beginning of March rather we're kind of on borrowed time for uh, for cutting willow because the best time is definitely when they're dormant you know when the sap isn't uh, isn't rising. The willow lasts longer then, um, but equally, you know, you've got a much, a much better material that's that's easily bendable. Because of course, if you cut the willow in the summer, it dries out very, very quickly and becomes, becomes quite brittle. So what I do to make the uh, make the sides is just sharpen up these uh, these uh, nice, relatively thick rods. The rods that I'm going to use for the the sides and um, that I've used for the base, in fact, are thicker than the ones that I'm kind of weaving through. So. Uh, I'll just push this up through this bottom bit here, snap it a bit there, and then push it down through there. And what I found certainly is that um, to begin with, it all looks slightly random. But after you've done it and trimmed it up, it looks it looks rather rather nice. And the trimming of the thing makes all the difference, in fact. So I just bend that up like that. And of course, that's sufficient. That's in place now very very simple but it's so so strong and of course once the weave has gone through all these uprights it's incredibly strong so I do this several times and of course one of the best things about this is even if you've only got a small garden a little a relatively small space if you've got an area that's sort of three meters by three meters if you plant it with rods say 60 centimeters apart then chances are you'll have enough little rods in one year to make a, a neat little basket like that of your own and of course they constantly replace one another these rods are, are literally a year old they're single season rods so you can see what I've done there very very simple and then I just literally lift these up and then tie them all up together the, uh, I don't, it doesn't really matter what you tie them up with. This is a little bit of raffia that I've got from kept over for some packaging. It's good stuff. It's kind of it doesn't slip, so uh, yeah, it's kind of handy. Everything comes in. I was watching a program last night on the compulsive um, hoarding disorders, and Sarah said, "Oh, that's you." <laughs> but it, I mean, you know, it's it's remarkable what does come in. I, I'm not quite sure that I'd have newspapers stacked to the ceiling, but you know, I mean, I've got lots of old newspapers in the house. <laughs> But not, it's not it's quite to that extent. Now I can start weaving through the uh, through the sides. So I'll put these two little rods in like this, like so, and then 
just kind of overlap them over one another. So with this little interspersed weave all sorted, it's dead simple. All I do now is just go back to taking the rod and just going kind of in and out of, uh, of all the uprights. And, uh, and what I tend to do is try and find the lowest point uh, around the circumference of the basket to put the thicker end. And then you're kind of building, always building up the lowest points then. All I'll do, bits that are kind of protruding above the rim of the finished basket, I'll take them and I'll just very carefully put my thumb in there, bend them down. Some will snap, but because of the nature of willow, it, it's so tough, and because it toughens up so beautifully when it dries, uh, it's uh, it's wonderful stuff. It doesn't it doesn't become brittle. So I just bend that over like that, and then weave it through a couple of the the other uprights, like so. And then it becomes really quite nice and tight on here. I take my little secateurs, and I'll find the point at which I need to cut it so that I can stick it down adjacent to uh, uh, another of these uprights and then that will hold the thing in really tight and I just take all these little sharp edges off because I really kind of the last thing you'd want if you're in the house if you'd kind of brush past is to catch stuff on those little sharp edges uh, so I'm just going to trim them up Okay, and that's it. The finished article. And I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm rather pleased with that. I think it's been, it's been quite nice to make it. I can guarantee you won't see anything like this on Gardener's Click or the whole of YouTube, for that matter. You can see here that I've started building the, these the burial mats for the two dogs. Um, I've borrowed this rock from a very dark place which you'll see in a minute and really there's very little life in that place but what I'd like is for these mounds to provide some life for all sorts of other animals uh, and, in, and in many respects it's quite a romantic notion that they're on top of the dogs which have you know which are now kind of deceased so anyway I'm going to build this now and then we're going to head up and we're going to go and borrow some more stone Okay, well I've got my trusty wheelbarrow and I'm going to head into the woods now to pick up some nice big juicy stones to finish George's burial mound. So this wonderful little dell, this was, is obviously a, a derelict little cottage, uh, probably uh, lived in at one time by guys that would have been working in the quarries that are uh, either side of us. They'd been taking out the limestone to, to burn down to use as a building material or fertiliser for the fields. Uh, so it's, it's probably been derelict for several hundred years now in fact. Uh, what there's a, there's a mix of stone and these wonderful little handmade bricks. You've got those wonderful little fingerprints in the clay when they'd have been dropped into the, uh, the, the, uh, the clay moulds before firing. And it's remarkable to think that those three little fingertips there uh, were from uh, somebody's fingers several hundred years ago now. wall gone under here, you know. Look at that. So you've got here the, the original lime mortar that was put between these these stones. That's still intact now. You can reuse old lime mortar rather amazingly. You can sort of make it up again, knock it up again. Look what I'm uncovering now. This obviously must have been the floor at some stage. Well, I think we've almost got enough stone here and it's deceptively heavy despite appearances of not having that many stones in the barrow. It's really windy up here, it's wonderfully atmospheric and you can probably tell by the sound of the wind whipping across the mic 
of the kind of environment that we're in. So with that said, I'm going to head back down to the bottom. Okay, so I've borrowed that lovely bit chunky rock down. I'm going to finish George's burial mound now. And the piastre resistance is this fabulous fossil. This enormous piece of sea life from millions of years ago. Well, one of the last things I wanted to show you today was uh, just sowing some broad beans. Very simple exercise. Uh, I've already got a couple of rows of broad beans in, but I wanted to do a couple of rows in a slightly different way. A, to see how well they do and perhaps show you later on in the year. Um, but also for me to get an idea of, of how well they do and whether or not I need to be sowing in a slightly different way in order to get the best from my bean plants. What, you, what you, you'll notice here is, uh, unlike my mate Terry Walton, I don't bother putting the broad beans in the air and cover them to get them started. I just throw them straight in the ground. So the first thing I want to do is put my plank on the garden and I'm just going to rake out a nice little row, a couple of rows and sow the beans in that. Uh, just a couple of inches deep, not too deep. You want it deep enough so they don't sort of push themselves up out of the ground, but equally not too deep so that they spend a long time trying to find the surface. But on the flip side of that, a lot of market gardeners, for instance, will put the broad beans in very deep in the ground. Because if you imagine certain areas like in the Vale of Evesham, for instance, it's very exposed, very open, it's better if those beans have a good hold fast. It means that they're less likely to sort of blow over. So I'm going to use my dibber and uh, sow some broad beans in another row as well. See if there's a contrast between the way in which each perform. So that's it really, job done, very simple and straightforward, it's, uh, I, I like broad beans on many different levels. It would be great to see how well they do, I, I'm kind of thinking that the, the, the beans that I planted in the shallow trenches will show themselves first, uh, but uh, I think I'm more interested to know whether or not the ones that are deep down in the ground produce as much if not more beans than the ones that are uh, further up because perhaps they up their roots are slightly deeper and they feel more secure in the ground and consequently they produce more fruit. Who knows? Remains to be seen. We'll, uh, we'll have to see come May and June when they're ready. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of My Life on the Hill. It's been an episode that's tainted with a little bit of sadness, but I think we've possibly uh, given the dogs a legacy in creating those wonderful little features that will pave the way for habitat for many other little animals. And, uh, and in many respects, my little girl will be able to run around those, those wonderful doggy cenotaphs and, uh, and, and recognise the little animals that she's uh, played with when she was very, very tiny. I'll see you next time. <laughs>